went through in the last part of this uh, vision of Daniel. We looked at the characteristics from uh, the last part of, uh, of chapter 11. And again, we took three weeks to go through uh, Daniel 11 because there's so many uh, details in it in terms of prophecy that's already been fulfilled. And then only last week we got to portions of that prophecy that are yet future uh, pertaining to uh, the Antichrist. And now as things kind of conclude here, uh, we get to characteristics that will be during the last half of, uh, of the tribulation period. Now, uh, Daniel's already told us back in chapter 9 the fact that there would be, from the issuing of the decree to re rebuild and restore Jerusalem in particular, the walls, so from the date of uh, the issue of Cyrus uh, to be able to do that under Nehemiah, we could count off, and again, if we do the math, the Babylonian calendar, according to Dave, uh, Daniel's prophecy, 173,880 days to that day, then the Messiah would come. Uh, and of course, Jesus did come on that exact day, what we call sometimes Palm Sunday as he rides into uh, Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. And he is hailed by that crowd in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy uh, that he's the Messiah. They say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They put their cloaks down. They put their palm branches down as uh, Zechariah said that they, they, they would. So that is fulfilled to the day. Then Daniel said, but then the Messiah would be cut off. And, and obviously, uh, Jesus was as he was crucified by uh, the end of the week, uh, rises again uh, three days later. Then Daniel said there'll be one more time period, a seven-year period, uh, that it would be yet to be fulfilled that uh, we refer to as the Great Tribulation. Old Testament sometimes uses the terminology, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, and that time period would be broken up to two, three and a half um, year periods. What he's making reference in this text, the last part of this prophecy, is that last three and a half uh, year period. And there's uh, six characteristics that I've uh, outlined for us. The first one is at the end of the tribulation will be time of great distress. Uh, and again, this is talking about uh, for the Jewish people in particular. But uh, verse one says, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So in the midst of the distress, uh, Michael will rise to protect uh, Israel. Now, we've already been uh, introduced to Michael, who is the archangel. He's he is uh, the only angel in the Bible described that way to this exalted position as this archangel in the book of Jude. We've uh, got that description uh, of him. So he is the chief uh, among, the, uh, uh, among the angels. Uh, in the book of, um, of, uh, uh, of Exodus there, when Moses is unable to go into the promised uh, land and so forth, you will remember that, uh, that uh, we are told from Jude that Satan comes... And, uh, and Michael enters into a dispute with him over the body of, of Satan, uh, excuse me, of Moses. And we don't really know the details or what Satan's plans were and so forth. But we see uh, the reference there that Michael says, the, the Lord rebuke you. So that's a, that's a, good, uh, a good thing to keep in mind when the, the chief angel rebukes uh, Satan in the name of the Lord. That's, that's a pretty good formula for uh, us as well. That's not the only time we find these two uh, in, in combat with each other. Uh, in Revelation 12, 7, uh, we find uh, John writes, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. Then ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. 
he was hurled to the earth uh, and his angels with him. So uh, these two, and we could look at some other passages, have, have been contending or warring with each other uh, over the ages. And then it kind of climaxes still yet future, because this is, again, book of Revelation, still yet to be fulfilled. And we know, of course, from the book of Job that uh, uh, Satan has access to the throne of God where he accuses the brethren day and night as he did, uh, did Job. But there's a point in time where, where uh, God's had enough and, and Michael engages him in this cosmic combat and, uh, and hurls him down with, again, a third of the angels that, uh, as we know, follow, follow Satan. But anyway, this is Michael, the archangel, who at this point in the end of the tribulation period, that last three and a half years, will actually come then and rise to the occasion, be sent by God to uh, protect uh, Israel because they're going to be <coughs> going under a time of uh, tremendous distress uh, because we know that, uh, that Satan will be doing all he can to persecute them. Satan's read the end of the book. He knows how the story ends. He knows that in the end, what ushers Jesus Christ back to planet Earth uh, to defeat uh, him, uh, and, and again, he and personified through the embodiment of the Antichrist and his, his military that uh, we had some uh, details about uh, last week uh, in Daniel's revelation. Uh, but uh, we know that Satan knows the end of the story, so uh, it's the Jewish people the, uh, that cry out at the end to recognize Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the Messiah that died for their sins. Again, there's many Jewish people around the, around the world that have obviously already done that. The early church was all Jewish before uh, Paul got preaching the gospel out to the Gentiles and so forth. And the number of uh, Messianic congregations, not only in this country, but in particular in Israel, are, are growing at a tremendous rate. Uh, but in the end, there will be nationally uh, as a group Israel will cry out and uh, realize that Jesus is their savior that's what brings him black to planet earth that's what uh, fulfills revelation 19 satan knows that so through the ages he's made several attempts to basically annihilate the jewish people it's the reason that we have anti-semitism in in the world today which is uh, tremendously growing and we know that in the end from other prophecies that all the nations of the earth will turn against israel and right now they all have but one we're still kind of hanging in there kind of question some of the decisions of our state department once in a while but so far uh, we still remain an ally that will not always be the case uh, in the end they will they will have to fend for themselves and look to the Lord. But during that last period, again, that three and a half years, there'll be tremendous persecution uh, against the Jews. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, <coughs> when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, when you see it, uh, and again, what that is, is the Antichrist, the last Gentile world ruler, sets uh, his, an image of himself up in the newly rebuilt Jewish temple. When he does that, he will announce himself that he is God, he is to be worshipped, and he will unleash a holocaust against the Jewish people. Jesus, having said that in the Olivet Discourse, says, then when you see that, and realize what it is, then you're to flee and, and get out and into the Jordan, into present-day Jordan, into that wilderness uh, as fast as you can. He says, pray that it's not in winter. Pray that you're not pregnant. Pray that it doesn't happen on the Shabbat or the Sabbath. Because on the Sabbath in Israel today, there's no public transportation. <laughs> All the buses are locked up. Uh, there's no way to get anywhere. Uh, and so Jesus says, pray that it's not on any of those occasions because you'll have to flee right away. That ushers into this time where that will happen, but at the same time, Michael will come to begin to supernaturally protect that remnant that will go out into, we believe, again, based on the prophecies of the Old Testament, the area of Basra, not the one in Iraq, but the one in present-day Jordan. In the Greek, the title is, uh, uh, is Petra. Uh, while that's going on, of course, and even uh, before that, there are many There'll be many uh, Jewish people in Israel that come to faith uh, in, uh, in uh, Jesus as their Messiah. 
early on in the book of Revelation, John tells us that 144,000, 12 from each, uh, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel will be sealed by God and protected so the Antichrist cannot uh, persecute them, destroy them, and so forth. And so uh, basically the, uh, the Israel and the earth will see at that time uh, 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams that will be out uh, preaching the gospel wherever they can. We also know that uh, during that time period, uh, God will send uh, angels that will actually go throughout the earth, what the book of Revelation says, preaching the gospel to every people uh, in every tongue. Uh, no one will be able to say, I never heard the gospel, never never got here. All of that will be gone, going on. It will be a time of, uh, of God pouring out his wrath on this earth. And again, that's what Revelation says. Uh, again, uh, 4 and 5 is, is the story of the church going to heaven. Chapter 6 is the Antichrist being revealed. And from then on to chapter 18 are the details of this time period, which are, are horrific to, uh, to say the least. But in the midst of that, many people will be coming to uh, faith in Christ. The Jews will be persecuted by the Antichrist tremendously. Michael will protect them supernaturally, uh, but it'll be a, a very difficult uh, time uh, for them. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, he mentions that in the midst of all of that, uh, true believers will have their names written in the book of, of life. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be uh, revealed. And we've got a lot of references. There's about uh, eight times in the Bible that talks about the book of life or the books of life. And the fact that uh, uh, if you have come to faith in Christ, your name is written in the book of life, but there's no details. No details is a good thing because what's detailed there is your sins. All the sins you've ever committed. All the, all the ones that you thought about committing. All the things, not just what you did, but the things you should have done and didn't do. Uh, it's, all, it's all listed there. People that have not come to faith in Christ at the end of Christ's millennial reign, we'll talk about in a moment, those books are going to be open and, and God will, uh, will judge them. But the good news for us is that when that book is open, it's covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not just here's all of our sins and it says paid in full. There's nothing even listed there because the Bible says God will remember our sins no more. He's not forgetful. He's just chosen in his sovereignty to remember our sins no more. And that's, uh, that's a, a glorious thing. But this idea of, of the books goes all the way back even to Moses in Exodus 32, verse 31. It says, uh, Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. Now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go lead the people to the place I spoke of and my angel will go before you. Uh, David in Psalm 69 uh, verse 28 says, may they uh, be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. And we could go on with other, uh, other uh, references. Reve Revelation 20 uh, talks about the, the book of life as well. So apparently in the time of tremendous distress and persecution with Israel that's going to take place in the last three and a half year period, Michael will be the one, the archangel, the chief angel uh, dispatched by God who will protect. You see, how can that remnant uh, of Israel survive against the Antichrist? Christ. We just read about him last week. Man, he is armed to the teeth militarily. He's calling all the shots and so forth. How are they going to survive out there in that, uh, in that wilderness? Well, when you got the chief angel, the archangel protecting you, uh, you're going to be okay. It's not going to be easy, uh, but uh, they will, will survive. And at the end of that time, they will find, those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, will find that their names are written in the book of life. Their sins have been forgiven. The second thing is at the end of the tribulation, we'll see a different resurrection. Uh, it's in verses 2 and 3. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So, uh, again, uh, we see different resurrections for uh, different uh, groups of people. And I don't uh, want to break this down to too much of a systematic theology course here. 
although it's my tendency, but I'll try not to. But just briefly, because I, I think it needs a little clarification. Sometimes you'll hear or read that there basically is our two resurrection, a general resurrection for all believers, and the one I just mentioned, the one for unbelievers before they stand before the white throne judgment of God. And just going through a couple of scriptures, we'll see that actually that's, that's really not the case. There, there are different groupings of believers uh, that, uh, that are in, in the Bible. And, uh, and Daniel's point here is that uh, the Old Testament believers aren't resurrected to, uh, until the end of the tribulation. Does that mean there's some kind of soul sleep or something? No, that's not taught in the Bible either. Uh, Paul says to be absent from the body, this physical body, is to be present with Christ. Uh, He says in Philippians, when he's thinking that he might be uh, uh, martyred at that point, he says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is uh, better by far. Uh, But what it does mean then is that who we really are, our personalities, our soul, our mind, will, and our emotions, our spirits that have been born again will go to be with the Lord when this physical body, this old tent uh, dies away. And if if you've ever been with someone uh, who's died, who's passed away, you realize very quickly they're not there anymore. Uh, There's a physical body there, but that person that I knew that I loved and so forth, they're not there anymore. And if they're a believer, uh, they're with the Lord uh, in that very, uh, that very moment. But there's a subsequent time when we actually receive our glorified bodies. Paul says our, our uh, citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Uh, John talks about the fact that when we, we see him, we will be like him in terms of uh, receiving our, our glorified body. So when does that uh, all take place if it doesn't happen the moment we die? Well, uh, let's back up a little bit and say that Jesus is the first one that's resurrected. And the Bible says he is the first fruits of that which is to come. Again, what his resurrected body is like will be what our bodies will be like uh, in the future. Amen. <laughs> That's, that gets to be really good news as you get older. Uh, uh, so uh, the second uh, uh, group of believers would be the church age believers. That's us. That will be resurrected together at the rapture uh, of, of the church. Uh, again, First, uh, first Thessalonians 4, 16, 18, kind of the classic uh, rapture uh, passage. Paul says, there that for the Lord himself will come down from heaven. I like that, that the Lord himself comes down from heaven uh, to meet us. Uh, and then with a loud command with the voice of the archangel, whose voice is that? Michael's. That's be the first time we actually hear his voice. Uh, we'll hear Michael's, Michael's voice, which is kind of cool. And the trumpet call of God. I don't know who's playing that, but I bet it'll be good. Uh, and then it says, notice, and here we go, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That was a concern of the church in Thessalonians. Uh, they knew Jesus was coming back, and they had already had uh, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord that had died. What's going to happen to them? And Paul addresses that issue. Don't worry about it, because the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we'll be with the Lord forever. And then he says, therefore, encourage each other with these words. So, uh, so I want to be in the rapture, just personally. I don't know if I get to, we don't get to really pick, but I, I, would, just, I would prefer to be in the rapture. I think it's the best deal, <laughs> because that way you actually don't ever face uh, the, you know, uh, death itself because you're just caught away in the twinkling of an eye. How fast is that? That's pretty fast. <laughs> and then you get your resurrection, resurrected body immediately uh, as you meet those that have gone be- before us uh, who are already caught up, and we meet them in, in the clouds, and so we're with the Lord uh, forever. So church-age believers are one category. Uh, there's also... Uh, a few, uh, an instance of Old Testament believers that were resurrected just after uh, uh, Jesus was uh, uh, raised from the dead. And uh, this is just kind of an anomaly, but it's just kind of interesting. Uh, Matthew 27, 51 to 53. 
Uh, and it talks about at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And w- one of the things about that is uh, Josephus and others say that if Caiaphas was where he was supposed to be on the day of atonement, he was standing there and saw the whole thing. I know in the movies, we've usually, he's usually pictured out there on Calvary watching Christ be crucified. And maybe he was, we don't know. But if he was doing what the high priest was supposed to be doing all that day, he was standing there and he saw the curtain of the temple to torn from top to bottom. Again, the idea that God's presence was now open uh, to everyone would have freaked him out just a little bit. Uh, At at that point, though, then it says that the earth shook and the rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. After Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city, Jerusalem, uh, and appeared to many people. So it's interesting. Not all But a few, some Old Testament believers actually at that point in time divinely given their resurrection bodies for the purpose of obviously being a witness to Jesus was the Messiah. He is resurrected and if you haven't noticed, so are we. That would be pretty effective maybe if uh, you had a few family members that are still around and maybe hadn't come to their senses yet in terms of realizing that Jesus uh, is the Messiah. The fourth category would be the Old Testament saints that Daniel mentions here uh, when he says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting uh, contempt. Notice that uh, verse 13, what the... Uh, Uh, the uh, angel says in regards to uh, Daniel himself, uh, as for you, this is Daniel, go your way till the end. You will rest. And then at the end of the days, the days we're talking about, the tribulation, at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Daniel will be, get his resurrected body at the end of the tribulation, along with the rest of the uh, Old Testament saints. So again, we've, we've got Jesus, the first resurrection, the first fruits of that which would come, church aid believers uh, uh, at the rapture of the church. You've got this kind of an interesting anomaly for the point of, of witnessing a few Old Testament believers that received their resurrected bodies after Jesus uh, resurrected from the, the dead himself. Uh, and now you've got Old Testament believers uh, at the end. Is that everybody? One more category of people. That would be the tribulation saints. Tribulation saints uh, apparently are, are resurrected uh, at the same time. And again, we see them in heaven. We see them uh, at the very throne of God. And, and these are, are, are the people that have come to faith in Christ during the tribulation. And, and for the most part, they're all going to be martyred. They're all going to be killed uh, by the Antichrist. And apparently their life wasn't real easy even before that happened. Because in heaven, God gives them a special place before his throne. It's in Revelation 7. He gives them a special place there uh, right, before, right at his throne. Uh, they have a special place. They have a special service uh, un, unto the Lord. And that's the passage uh, where, he, uh, where he says to them, Uh, never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching wind. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to streams of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's tribulation saints. I think a lot of that certainly maybe applies to everybody in heaven who's undergone difficulty <laughs> in this life, but, but it's uh, especially uh, for them. And apparently uh, they receive their resurrected bodies at the end of that tribulation period. So again, it's a little more, there's more of a breakdown than one general resurrection, one at the end for those that haven't received Christ. There's actually five different groups of people we see in the Bible as far as the resurrection. The other thing we note here is that we see a different resurrection at the end for the millennial reign of Christ uh, that we've uh, already mentioned. That's the, uh, the wicked that are dead will not rise until the end uh, of that thousand year period where they will stand before, <coughs> before God and before the, what we call the white throne uh, judgment. The other thing we see here that I think is, uh, is really neat is uh, we see a different set of values when believers are rewarded uh, at the resurrection. That's in verse 3. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness 
like the stars uh, forever and ever. There's a lot of people that aspire <laughs> to be stars, uh, to be seen in this life, and, uh, and certainly their, their glory uh, fades very, very quickly. Who won the Best Academy Award for the male actress two years ago? <laughs> I don't even know what it was a year ago. How about 20? It all goes pretty fast. Uh, a way of illustrating it would be to think about, to go with some of the language here, is if you went on the, um, on the beach on 4th of July in, in Kailua and, uh, and watched the fireworks show, you know, we're all, ooh and ah. It's kind of interesting, you know, when you see it live and you're in a big crowd because you get the ooh, you get the oohs and the ahs and, uh, and everything. And then, uh, and, but it's all over pretty quickly. All those thousands of dollars. It's all over pretty, pretty quickly. It all fades pretty quickly. So in comparing uh, the rewards that we would receive in heaven, God doesn't compare it to fireworks that marvel everybody for a short time. He compares it to the stars in heaven. If you were to wait till all the crowd was gone, all the fireworks was gone, and if it was uh, not a cloudy night, then you would see the real show in heaven, those stars glistening up there. That's the comparison. There's things in this life that we think are special or valuable, and they're nothing. That's why Paul says in, uh, in Romans, he says, I, I consider that our present sufferings, and he had a few, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed uh, in us. So a different set of values when believers are resurrected as well. They will shine like the brightness of the heavens. That's us. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So this time, tremendous distress different resurrection at the end. Three, at the end of the tribulation, there'll be a greater development of, of knowledge. We see that in verse four. I think probably one of the more misunderstood verses of the passage. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase uh, knowledge. So the prophecy will be sealed until a development of, of knowledge. I guess we picture, you know, Daniel rolls up the, screw, the, the scroll and then, and then puts the wax on it, puts the thing on it and like seals it, you know, with the, some kind of a marking and that's it. Nobody's reading this baby, you know, uh, that's, that's not what it means. Obviously, this was read over and over again. Uh, and, uh, and we've talked about the scroll of Daniel that was found in the, uh, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll. It was not just not sealed physically, but it was, uh, you know, meticulously copied because it was considered, you know, a portion of the word of God and so forth. Being sealed means people simply wouldn't understand it. Now, remember, and we made the comparison early on, uh, when John gets his revelation and writes it down, at the end, what does the angel say to him? Don't seal this up. <laughs> so there's a contrast. Seal this one up because people aren't going to get it for a while. Now, as we went through uh, all these prophecies, and, and as we said, uh, in Daniel chapter 11 alone, not the whole thing, but just Daniel 11 alone, in the first 35 verses, there's about 130 fulfilled specific prophecies in sequence. We went through 75, and I know you're real glad we didn't do all 130. But uh, nonetheless, we took a few weeks and did that to, uh, to make a point. But it's easy for us to look back historically because so much is fulfilled. So we then are obviously, we'd say we're closer to that understand of, understanding of this idea of development of knowledge. So what kind of knowledge is it? It's knowledge of prophecy. Uh, it's the ability to understand what's uh, being said in Daniel 11 and uh, in other places. And... Uh, uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of people will go to and fro is kind of the King James, New King James uh, uh, way of expressing that. And for a long time, I heard as a young guy, that meant that in the last days, uh, there's going to be a tremendous uh, increase in travel around the world. And that was because people were really thrilled the fact that you could ride in an airplane to 400 miles an hour and thought that would never be surpassed, so we must be in the end times. Uh, again, that's not what it's talking about. The, the running to and fro is to understand prophecy. Amos uses the same phrase and, uh, in Amos 8, 11 to 12 uh, for different reasons. Uh, he says there, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. 
They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to south. And here's our phrase. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to King James, New King James, and both phrases, NIV uses the term wander, and it doesn't quite get it because it, it doesn't allow us to, to, to match it up with Amos' words and kind of get the, uh, the meaning of it here. And Amos is saying there's going to be a time in the future when there's going to be a famine for the word of God. People are going to be running to and fro, not flying high in airplanes. They're just going to be trying to find the word of God, and they're not going to be able to find it. We're kind of, seems like we're, we're approaching those days uh, even, even now. All right, let's go back to Daniel. What does the phrase mean? It doesn't mean we're going to fly in airplanes real fast. Lots of travel and space travel. That's not what Daniel's talking about. He says there's going to be an increased development in people wanting to know more about prophecy and Daniel's prophecy uh, in, in particular. Uh, and certainly that will be the case during the tribulation time. Wouldn't you assume that by about <laughs> halfway through the tribulation period, uh, somebody's witnessing the events going around, around them. There's a guy that's taken over that's calling all the shots uh, in the world uh, and so forth. Uh, nobody can buy and sell without a mark and some of these other things. And then they read the book of Daniel and go, aha, this book is not sealed at all. In fact, there's an increase in knowledge so much that I know exactly what's going on. People will be able to do that. But it's not to say that that, uh, that uh, uh, isn't already uh, happening today. You know, there was really no such thing as prophecy conferences until about the turn of the, uh, of the last century, early, early 1900s. Uh, now, uh, it's incredible how many people are aware of all these basic tenets uh, of prophecy that we're, we're going through. And I kind of uh, do the repetition thing because I realize not everybody is here uh, every week and catches everything. Uh, but there's about uh, uh, 200 million people around the world today that understand all of these things in intimate details. They say, how do you know that? Because they've all read the Left Behind series. <laughs> <laughs> the Left Behind series, Jerry Jenkins, Tim LaHaye. It's a novel, but they depict very biblically uh, all the events of the tribulation period from the rapture all the way through the millennial reign of Christ and, uh, and on. They sold 65 million copies. And typically, when one book is sold, at least three people read it, sometimes four. So there's got to be a few hundred million people that understand pretty well that we're at a time Daniel said it was sealed before, it's not sealed anymore. We pretty much understand what, what Daniel says. And, uh, and we're approaching a time when it will be more obvious to people that will actually live through that period of time. Again, end of the tribulation, great distress, but Michael's going to intervene for the Jewish people. A different kind of resurrection uh, at the end of the tribulation for the Old Testament saints, a greater development in knowledge. And four, at the end of the tribulation, the power of Israel will be demolished. We see that in verses 5 to 7. <laughs> then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, uh, one on this bank of the river, one on the opposite bank. We've already identified those as uh, angels from uh, earlier teaching. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters uh, of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? And we've already identified this person as a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 7, the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, river, lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever and ever, saying it will be for a time, times, and a half time when the power of the holy people, Israel, has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. So as I said, even a reading that the messenger tells us that the power of Israel will be broken. And if you go back to the beginning of the vision, uh, the messenger here is described and matches the description of Jesus in the book of Revelation. So when, when Jesus Christ stands above the waters, lifts his left hand and his right hand to heaven and says, I swear by him who lives forever and ever, this is going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen uh, exactly the way that is uh, depicted here. The phrase of time, times and half time, again, we've already noted from Daniel 9 that it's a reference to a time, a year, uh, times two years and a half time. It's that last three and a half year period. Again, the power of uh, the holy people, Israel, will be demolished and it will be uh, 
a horrific time for uh, for the Jewish Jewish people in terms of the persecution that will uh, go out uh, against them uh, during this this Holocaust at the end. Uh, again, a greater development of knowledge, uh, the power of Israel. Uh, will be uh, demolished. Um, their tremendous military strength that they have and so forth will not help them uh, in this day. The fifth thing is that in the tribulation, there'll be a distinction between the wise uh, and the wicked. Uh, verses 8 to 10. I heard, but I did not understand, so I asked, my Lord, what would the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. So there's a distinction for the wise that they're going to be purified. When the Bible says somebody's going to be purified, what's going to happen to them? <laughs> they're going to go through the wash cycle more than once, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a good thing, but it's not such a good, good thing. When the Lord does his purifying work <laughs> in us, it means he's going to take us through the ringer and make us very humble until we realize he's the only thing that really matters <laughs> and he's got our attention. C.S. Lewis, the great Oxford scholar, would say uh, that um, uh, some people question God speaking to them, but in times of suffering, he's shouting. And, uh, and that's a little bit of uh, uh, what happens here again. Uh, but it's not in general. We're talking about the Jewish people. And in particular, uh, this group that is in Israel during this time period. Zechariah describes it. He says, in the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. They will say they are my people and uh, I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. Zechariah says that during this time period, two-thirds of the Jewish people will be killed. One-third will survive and they're going to be purified through this time of persecution. They're going to be supernaturally protected uh, by Michael, the archangel. And what we don't know is, is it, the two-thirds that are killed, is it just the two-thirds that are in Israel at that time, or is it two-thirds worldwide? If it's two-thirds worldwide, then uh, there's about 18 million uh, Jews in the world today, uh, so that would be about 12 million. That would be twice uh, the number that uh, died uh, in the Holocaust of uh, Nazi Germany, uh, and, um, but in one-third, the six million that are spared. So tremendous persecution the power of Israel is, is broken at this point in time. There's a distinction made between those that are wise. Uh, he who is wise wins souls, uh, Proverbs says. Those that recognize Jesus as the Messiah and those that do not, do not. The distinction of the wicked is that they continue in their wickedness. Again, this is read and somehow, again, understandably applied to, I guess during this time, there's tremendous wickedness that goes on in the world. Yes, there is. Uh, but again, this is all very specific to the Jewish people in the last three and a half years. And it's really talking about among them, even some of the remnant that survive, uh, there's still uh, a group of them that are really rebellious that God has to deal with even when he comes back to planet Earth. Uh, Ezekiel 20 verse 33 talks about that. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will rule over you with a mighty hand in an outstretched arm with outpoured wrath. I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you've been scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and outpoured wrath. I will bring you into the desert of the nations and there face to face I will execute judgment upon you. As I judged your fathers in the desert in the land of Egypt, so I will judge you, declares the sovereign Lord. I will take note as you pass under my rod. That's the way a shepherd would inspect his sheep. And I will judge you in the bond of the covenant. I will purge you from those who revolt and rebel against me. Although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, yet they will not enter the land of Israel, then you'll know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel says, even at this uh, later stage, God is still going to sort out from the mixed multitude, uh, real true believers from 
from those who remain in their wickedness, the wise <coughs> versus the wicked. Six, at the end of the tribulation, uh, the set duration of times will be of completed, and that's in verses 11 to 3. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there'll be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted uh, inheritance. So, again, the, uh, the explanation here is that we know from the time the Antichrist sets up the image uh, in uh, in, the, in the newly rebuilt uh, <coughs> Jewish temple, which preparations are being made for today, being discussed in the uh, Annapolis Peace Conference uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, how can we bring peace with Israel uh, and the Palestinian people? And, and one of the things that have got to be worked out in the equation as far as uh, refugees and all these other things is how do we get a temple rebuilt on the Temple Mount? It's on the table. It's been on the table ever since uh, <clears throat> the Clinton years, is that uh, that would be one way to bring Israel to, to the table and bring uh, the Orthodox Jews in Israel around to agreeing to give back land that they believe is theirs because God gave it to them. How do we bring them around? What's the carrot uh, that we put before them? It's a rebuilt temple in the Temple Mount. That's, we know it's going to happen in the tribulation period, and they're talking about it now. The priests are already trained for it. They've already rebuilt uh, all the implements and everything that they, they need. You can go to the, uh, uh, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem and, and actually see many of these things that will be used in the temple. That kind of tells me it's not a long ways away. I don't know about you, you know, but, you know, it's like uh, right after Thanksgiving, I see all these lights and stuff go up. I got a feeling Christmas is pretty close. I mean, it's not here, but I think it's pretty close. Uh, that's the idea. You see all of these things. It's like, okay, you know, <laughs> and the rapture's got to take place before that, you know, so uh, we're, we're getting closer. Uh, at the end of the tribulation, a set duration of times will have been completed. In that newly rebuilt temple from the time that Jesus said the abomination that causes desolation is set up, John tells us exactly what it is in Revelation. Again, the Antichrist, with the use of the false prophet, sets up an image of himself to be, uh, to be worshipped and so forth. We had a lot of details about that uh, uh, last week as well. Uh, once that happens, the Jews will flee. You can start to count the days, 1,260 days. Uh, and then Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth uh, to, again, rescue the Jewish remnant, destroy the Antichrist and his forces, and begin to set up his millennial kingdom. So how come this says 1,290 days and the 1,335 days? I'm glad you asked that question because <clears throat> I was about ready to wrap this whole thing up. There, and, uh, and a lot of people kind of speculate on this. I, I, uh, I think there's a, there's a couple of things that are obvious. One is that Jesus will come back on that 1,260 days. There's another 30-day 30, 30 period. In terms of what's going on during that, uh, uh, that time, uh, some of the things that we've, uh, we've just talked about, uh, Jesus will be dealing with that Jewish remnant and, and finding out as they pass under the rod who are, the, who are the true believers whose names are written in the book of life and, and who is still rebellious? And he'll, he'll be doing some separating there. Uh, there's also a, um, an additional 30 days because you've got the 1,290 days mentioned. Uh, and then you've got uh, the uh, 1,335 days. Other things that have got to take place during this time. We don't really know exactly the sequence, but we know other things have to take place. And that is, is that Jesus will judge uh, the nations of the world based on whether they are Semitic or anti-Semitic. He calls them sheep and goats. It's in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And you remember the rest of 
of what's said there. Uh, as he does that, the, the ones that are separated to the, the good side is the sheep, by the way. Uh, the, uh, they get separated on, on that side. He's going to be thanking them for what they've done uh, you know, for him. And they're going to say, but when did we ever uh, give you water to drink? And when we, did we ever feed you? When did we ever provide a home for you? When did we ever visit you in, in prison? And then Jesus will tell them, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of one of the, my brethren, the, his Jewish brethren, you did for me. Uh, and he judges the nations based on whether they're Semitic or anti-Semitic. This is at the end of, of the tribulation period in this Again, additional 30 days, additional 45 days. There's two other durations of time periods Daniel enumerates where Jesus is taking care of business, uh, basically. There's going to be the dealing with the Jewish remnant. There's going to be the dealing with the, the Gentile uh, nations uh, at that point. And then there's going to be job opportunities galore because the Bible says we will rule and reign with him during that millennial kingdom. We hoping to be the generation that gets raptured, feeling lighter every day, <laughs> we will come back with, uh, with Jesus Christ. And uh, as we uh, depicted in Revelation uh, 19, as we do and he establishes his kingdom here on earth, uh, we'll rule and reign with him. Uh, there'll be job opportunities. But again, we won't be being interviewed. We'll be being assigned. That assignment will be based on our faithfulness to God during this life. What we did with the talents and treasures and, uh, and abilities and the time that we had, uh, how we used it for the Lord will determine what we do. We're not going to be just on clouds like playing the harp and stuff. I was looking forward to playing the harp. Uh, no, no, we're going we're gonna to be busy, busy doing God's uh, bidding, but I think it'll be, a, it'll be a glorious time. All of that's taking place before we usher into the, we say millennial or the thousand year reign of, uh, of Jesus Christ before that, that all kicks in. I also think somewhere in there, there's a really big party. That's just my speculation, but just look at Jesus. Uh, he's in the parties and, uh, and having a good time, especially when it's time to celebrate. And we know there is a marriage supper of the lamb. And some people would place the marriage supper of the lamb uh, with the church age believers after the rapture during the time period that we're hanging, waiting for the tribulation to conclude. Others would place the marriage supper of the lamb at that point. All the believers celebrating together and then we job opportunities of glory and then we go into the uh, uh, millennial reign of Christ. It's not the end of the story, of course. A couple other events take place at the end of that, and then we go on into uh, e eternity. But uh, again, I think that um, uh, uh, it's important for us to kind of um, uh, get the details of what will happen, because I think it's really important that we've gotten the details of what has happened. I'm very glad that Daniel didn't get this vision and go, I'm not really into details. I'm, I'm just going to kind of write a couple of vague things down here about what's going to be happening. Generally, this will be kind of what's happening with world empires in the future. And generally, a few things will happen after that. He doesn't do it. He gives us incredible detail. So much that, uh, why hasn't this become a movie yet? I don't know. But uh, uh, incredible details, sequence of events so that we don't have to uh, doubt God's word. Uh, again, two things maybe to uh, take with us, at least from these, this last month of, of study, is the idea that when you hear someone say you can't trust God's word because there are errors in its transmission and it's being copied, copy to copy to copy. You can't trust it because of that. That is purported, said in uh, most leading universities uh, today and so forth. And we found that that's actually not true at all. And we talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Lane just came back from San Diego and he was able to visit uh, uh, there a traveling uh, exhibition of uh, many portions of, of the actual, some of the scrolls uh, or parchments from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And again, we know that we have the whole scroll of Isaiah and you can take a, a Masoretic text, a Jewish Bible from about 900 AD and you can, you can hold it up to the Isaiah scroll that's on display in Jerusalem and you can go, not word for word, you can go letter by letter by letter by letter by letter through the whole scroll. It's exactly the same. 
these two documents that are hundreds of years apart. It speaks to us of the accuracy of these guys when they did make the copies. When they copied it, they believed they were copying God's word. <laughs> did you know if they, they could copy a scroll like 40 feet long, if they got to the end, uh, they had to burn it and start the whole thing over. Every time they wrote God's name, they had to go wash themselves and wash God's clothes, wash their clothing because it was so holy that they wrote God's name. There's a reason why it's so accurate. And the other thing we take from it is that, is that God speaks in terms of predictive prophecy. We know that Daniel writes, he says, Jesus says he's a prophet and he's writing uh, under the rule of Cyrus, he's writing the 6th century BC of all the events of the four Persian kings that would come, of Alexander the Great, of his four generals, all the intrigue, all the fighting that would, would come about among them and exactly how that would end. And he, like I said, over 130 specific details in sequence. He writes it and some would say, hey, that's, uh, uh, it's, so, uh, it's so accurate. It had to have been written after the case We've already pointed out that copy of Daniel's scroll is all tucked away in a nice clay jar and it's waiting to be discovered there in the caves of Engedi, what we call the Dead Sea Scroll. Daniel's scroll was there. Uh, portions of every book of the Bible was there except the book uh, of Esther. So we know that predictive prophecy, Daniel spoke in advance. It's proof of God's existence and that he exists outside, as we learned on Wednesday night, outside the box or as we say, outside the time-space continuum. Therefore, what he says to us today, we can trust. What he says in the future, it's going to happen exactly that way. And there will be two resurrections in general. Believers will be resurrected and get their resurrected bodies. And unbelievers will be, rise again from a place of torment now to a place of judgment before God's white throne judgment, and they will be thrown into the lake of the fire where they will burn forever and ever and ever. And God wants us to know all of that, so it might change our mind about what's really important uh, in this life. <clears throat> the guy that started the Salvation uh, Army, uh, he, um, <clears throat> he was quite a preacher. And he said that he, I, he had a school where he would train up as evangelist. And he says, if I, if I could... I would dangle them by their heels over the fires of hell for three days. And then I would pull them back and send them out to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That kind of gets you revved up a little bit. If you see what it is you're really saving, saving people from. It's important that we see that as well. Uh, hell, fire, and brimstone. Great preaching for the believer. It's God's goodness that leads people to repentance. But for the believer, we need to hear it. We need to be reminded of it. Hey, we're going to be with the Lord. It's going to be glorious. Job opportunities galore. It'll be great. There will be the parties as well. I think they'll have great food and no calories. I just, it's just good. That's one thing about the glorified body. You could just, you won't have to worry about that stuff. Carbs, nothing. You won't have to be reading labels anymore. You know, what's in this one? How many of these can I eat? Uh, it'll be tremendous. But man, it'll be horrific in terms of that time period. God will move miraculously and his sovereign will will be done. And uh, as Paul says in Romans, and all Israel will be saved. Not that every Jewish person will be saved, but that remnant will cry out nationally, individually. Many do now, but nationally they will cry out. Christ will come back uh, and rescue them and we're coming with them. Oh, by the way, Revelation 19 we're riding horses. I don't know if you know how. You might want to work on that between now, now and then. God will probably give you the gift supernaturally. I went ahead and took the lessons just so I'm all prepped and ready to go, though. We're out of time. I wanted to read this to you, and um, I, I will anyway. This is, uh, it's never stopped me before. This is from the Applause of Heaven. It's an uh, uh, older book. Uh, the book's not old, but it was written a few years ago by Max Licato. I think he writes a new book every two weeks, the way they come out. But uh, really gifted writer. And, and he says this uh, about coming home. And if you've, um, the guys in the military will relate to this. But uh, anybody that has to kind of travel a bit for a living. He says, uh, home, it was my first thought when I woke this morning. It was my first thought when I stepped down from the last podium. It was my first thought when I said goodbye to my last host at the last airport. 
There's no door like the one to your own house. There's no better place to put your feet than under your own table. There's no coffee like the coffee that comes out of your own mug. There's no meal like the one at your own table. And there's no embrace like the one from your own family. Home, the longest part of going home is the last part. The plane's taxiing to the terminal from the runway. I'm the fellow, the flight attendant always has to tell to sit down. I'm the guy with one hand on my briefcase and the other on my seatbelt. I've learned that there's a critical split second in which I can bolt down the aisle into the first class section before the tributaries of people begin emptying into the main aisle. I don't do that on every flight, only when I'm going home. There's a leap of the heart when I exit the plane. I almost get nervous as I walk up the ramp. I step past people. I grip my satchel. My stomach tightens. My palms sweat. I walk into the lobby like an actor walking onto a stage. The curtain is lifted. The audience stands in half moon. Most of the people see that I'm not the one that they want and look past me. But from the side, I hear a familiar shriek of little girls. Daddy! I turn and see them. Faces scrubbed, standing on chairs, bouncing up and down in the joy uh, as the man in their life walks towards them. Jenna stops bouncing just long enough to clap. She applauds. I don't know who taught her to do that, but she can bet I'm not going to tell her to stop. Behind them, I see a third face, little Sarah, only a few months old. Deeply asleep, she furrows her brow slightly in reaction to the squealing. And then I see a fourth face, my wife's face. Somehow she's found time to comb her hair, put on a new dress, put on that extra sparkle. Somehow, though, wrung out and done in, she will make me feel that my week is the only week worth talking about. Faces of home. That's what makes the promise at the end of the beatitude so compelling. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. What is our reward? Home. This place isn't. But uh, and that's why we're slightly discontent at times <laughs> with the world that we live in. Uh, that's what brought C.S. Lewis to faith in Christ. He realized that we really weren't made for this place, so there's really got to be another place. And uh, it's with the Lord. <laughs> 